Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our fireside chat with Sri Ambadi, CEO and founder at HCO.ai, and Agus Sujanto, VP and Head of Corporate Model Risk at Wells Fargo, who will discuss model safety and validation and how Wells Fargo has been using H2O Wave. Before I hand it over to Sri, I'd like to share that we'll have a few minutes for Q&A towards the end of the conversation. So please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the Q&A tab on Zoom or via the comments section on LinkedIn, Twitch, or Twitter. So welcome, Sri and Agus. Thank you, Bruna. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, good evening for people on the uh, uh, online. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Agus, for um, taking the time to spend with our community and um, H2O. Super excited um, for some fireworks. So um, we can get started uh, with lots of good a gamut of really interesting topics on the agenda between interpretability through uh, how COVID has disrupted modelers' lives and how model validation can be a powerful um, um, way to bring uh, sanity to the models that have gone completely wrong. Um, without further ado, I want to have your comment about why model validation, I think I heard a quote from you, model validation yeah. is not software QA. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, uh, I think this is probably uh, model validation and independent model validation came from the financial world, right? The practice in the financial institution uh, as a re very regulated entity in the U.S., uh, it, the institution need to have an independent group that's doing model validation, completely independent from model developer. And they have to report management path, management reporting chains are, are different to make sure that they are independent. Now, when we start talking about model, uh, we know and we believe all models are wrong, right, Sri? All models are wrong. They are useful, but all of them are wrong. I'm and and, and but they are useful, okay? Uh, knowing that using model, that means we know we are, use, we are taking risk because the model will be wrong and can be wrong. And when models are wrong or doing something wrong or unintended has unintended consequence, it creates damage. It creates harm to either the customer or to the institution itself. So it's very, very important when we build model, we develop model, we, we, we deploy model, we know how the model will be wrong and what to do about it, has the risk mitigation. So to me, model validation is the equivalent of reliability engineer or safety engineer in product design. So I used to design car engine for, for Ford Motor Company, right? Before my life in, in banking. So we have a design engineer who design product and we have reliability engineer and safety engineer who test the product, test the situation in the environment where, where, where the product will fail and uh, if there are any safety concern. So uh, when we look at model validation, it's not simply a, a QA exercise similar to a software QA. It's not that at all, right? Because unlike software is deterministic, model is probabilistic, right? You have probability of, of wrong when, 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 when software is deterministic. So understanding that and how the model will be wrong and what are the source that create the model will be wrong and test it independently. So the focus of model validation is to test, not on the performance, but to test to fail the model, right? So model developer, rightly so, need to focus on model performance, optimizing model performance. Model validation will focus, I'm going to make the model wrong. What situation? What's environment? What scenario? What usage condition? Uh, model will be wrong and where that can be wrong. It can be from data input, can be all kind of things. So COVID-19 is a perfect example of this, right? The environment completely different, completely changed. And the input that used to be, there used to be uh, the input in the normal way becoming super, super abnormal, right? 
the uh, who would have thought that credit quality in the US credit quality during COVID-19 time, everybody credit quality credit score is going up. It's because nobody have uh, allowed to be flagged as default. So nobody default, nobody delinquent because of forbearance and all of those things. So, so that's the thinking in terms of how the model can be wrong, in what situation, and what source of the model is wrong, and how to mitigate them. And that's, that's really the focus of model validation. I think you said uh, COVID-19 is a perfect example of the lack of imagination to test the model's uh, boundary conditions. Um, how could we have prepared better? Well, I think this is uh, bring to the uh, uh, COVID-19 is probably the extreme un unusual environment, right? But in general, even during the normal usage, we need to think about uh, the issue of model robustness, right? Uh, the model world is not perfect. So when we build model in machine learning world, we split data, uh, training data, testing data, and we pick model that's the best based on testing data. Well, that's a perfect environment because your data, it doesn't change. Your data is static, right? And in real world, the, uh, the input is dynamically changing and COVID-19 is perfect example. It's the completely changed. And even the model see some, the, the model has to operate in environment that they never seen before in the training data. So in terms of lack of imagination is, we should really, so that we don't have a problem like what we encounter, many situations that we encounter in, during COVID-19 when they hit the first time is really thinking about in what situation the model is going to operate and test it, test the robustness under that situation. So we know probably model will fail, but at least we know it upfront how the model will fail and how we're going to, uh, how, how we're going to deal with when the model will fail. So I, I think, I think this is very important and uh, I'm bringing the issue of safety here I, I, again. And uh, when, when, uh, when we designed car engine long time ago, right? Uh, we have, uh, we, 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 we can shut down the engine to operate in limping mode. The throttle body will not, cannot be openly wide open so that uh, it's going to, uh, you can drive it with limping mode, they will go slow you know, in a safety mode. So it's, uh, so I think it's very important to understand that. So because when your model fail, you know, it's going to get exposed to, uh, uh, to a certain environment when the model never get exposed. The model should be uh, uh, either, either smart enough or uh, have a, a, a safety situation where it's operate in a limping mode so that it will not create harm. I think one of the things that the team has been working on is actually the H2O AI app store, as you know. And one of the apps that the team has worked on is uh, adversarial testing. Mm. How do yeah. you use uh, AI to start testing um, and building uh, adversarial tests against AI? Mm. So for example, here we have a uh, ability to connect to automatic machine learning like driverless AI and use it to start testing against um, models and start creating a very strong uh, adversarial um, mm -hmm. look at the boundaries, create some real um, conditions against the target variable. Mm -hmm. Get some uh, depth income ratio, pick some interesting models, mm -hmm. columns to attack, and then right. generate. Um, what kind of um, rate at which you want to change the data in the ranges that are right. real in the domain. Right. But adversarial testing is going to become a more and more uh, necessary uh, function as opposed to a um, good to have. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would put it in the, uh, in a broader context, right? Uh, because you have adversarial testing or people sometimes call it counterfactual or in general, it's a really a, uh, a generalization of sensitivity analysis, right? So you perturb your input because, hey, this is the environment that I'm go going to operate. And then from the environment, possible environment, you start thinking about how are we going to perturb the input to reflect that kind of environment? 
And in machine learning, this is very, very important and, and becoming very important because unlike linear model, well, the model is very, very clear. We know very easily the weakness and how robust the model will be. The robust evaluation is easy. In machine learning, it's a lot more complicated because the model is non-linear or even if, uh, if linear, it's, uh, it's locally linear. So in overall, it's, uh, it's, it's highly non-linear. So it's becoming a lot more complicated and uh, having exhaustive testing also very difficult. So it's, uh, I think it's a very, very, uh, very important area so that we know what is the limit of the model, robustness of the model. In fact, sometime when we choose model uh, that, that we, where we want to deploy, we may not choose the model that has the best performance in the situation of standard or ideal situation performance. We may choose model that in the, uh, in the ideal situation from training testing is uh, slightly worse, but when you test it, it's a lot more robust. Yeah. I think the, I think the idea is that making sure that the model is not deployed without a lot advanced um, validation schemes around the scenarios. And I think it, it, um, you, you mentioned um, your early days in car safety. How did that help you? Now you're, I, I think of you as the lord of all models over at uh, <clears throat> Wells Fargo as the EVP of corporate risk modeling. How did that journey um, in looking at um, human safety in, in cars uh, kind of um, help you in looking at uh, safety of models? In yeah, uh, I think the uh, some of the practice that we we we. It's a long time practice in the uh, in in engineering, right? We we talk about in engineering. We talk about tail testing. We talk about tail testing. Mean we're going to test the product at the tail condition, extreme situation. How is the product is going to fail? We need to understand that. That gives a lot of thinking in our our approach, right? How to do tail testing? How to identify? A tail situation where the uh, where 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 model will fail. So that's very important. And then the concept that is very very powerful in engineering in the 90 in terms of robust design. You want to design product that is robust or uh, operate in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the changing environment. For example, uh, we test product in the uh, in high elevation in uh, in Colorado or in the heat of that valley in the humidity of, uh, of Miami, right? So all kind of things, product operate that way. So model is similar way. Model operate under different situation, facing different uh, subject and all of those things. So in some situation, product uh, model cannot be retrained all the time. For example, credit model. Credit model has to be robust. We originate credit and has to be good through the cycle in a good time and in a bad time. So model cannot just react very, very rapidly by, by changing, by, by retraining. Yes, marketing model, probably you want to operate in that mode, you know, you, you retrain your model all the time and do all those things. But in many, many situations in financial world, you cannot do that. You have to have model that is robust. So the thinking from engineering, on the robust design, on the reliability, tail tail testing, that's uh, have a humongous influence to uh, to uh, to model validation. Excellent. From model validation to robustness, to then we want to look at um, how to understand these models when they are wrong, mm. if the, when they've gone wrong. Mm. Uh, obviously, debugging those models needs yeah. a, lot, a lot of interesting um, techniques. Mm. One uh, such uh, impressive uh, method that came out of Wells Fargo through your uh, through your uh, team and your work has been uh, is uh, using locally linear methods. Mm. If you would love to kind of you would love to kind of double click on that and hear more about um, Aletia. Yeah, yeah. I I would I would uh, before we go to that I would I would step back in terms of uh, the the spectrum of where we apply machine learning from area that is giving alert to our investigator, if it's uh, for fraud or financial crime, 
all the way to model that decide the livelihood of people. Approving or not approving loan, right? Approving, not approving loan, approving for doing banking or not, that decide the livelihood of people. That's very, very critical. So with, with all those uh, spectrum, we need to understand in terms of transparency, interpretability of the model. So this is very, very important for us for many things that we do are very critical making decision of livelihood of people. So model that is self-explanatory is very important. Model that is intrinsically interpretable. Now the question is, can we have model that intrinsically interpretable, but also high performance? Then yes, the answer is yes, we can. Uh, we, we can have uh, intrinsically interpretable self-explanatory and high performance. Now, because model particular machine learning is a complex and how the model can be wrong is very complex. Transparency, truly understand what the model does and how the decision is made by model is very, very important. Now, uh, sometimes people when talk about, well, gradient boosting machine is uh, boosted tree. Well, it seems like very innocent. It's a tree, it's very simple. But when you have a thousand tree, it's not simple anymore, right? It's very, very complex and it can be very opaque. So you have to apply a post hoc interpretability like sharp, lime, and all of those things. You do post hoc interpretability, which is all right for area that is less in terms of high stake environment, not deciding the livelihood of people. When we start talking about deciding the livelihood of people, then we really need very, very interpretable model. This is part of things that we work on, how to create self-explanatory and interpretable model. And deep learning, uh, ironically, deep learning is the most interpretable model if we choose the right activation function, in this case, ReLU activation function because deep learning with ReLU activation function is basically local linear model. It's a linear model, just you have a thousand or it can be a million of them depending on how, uh, how complex the network is. So that's what really motivates us to looking at how can we make a deep learning as a self-explanatory and highly interpretable. Thus, we built a tool called Alicia, right? And uh, we put it in a uh, in Wave uh, with uh, uh, to, uh, to for people to have a, a better access. So maybe you want to demonstrate this uh, uh, with Alicia, which is basically after you train a, a deep learning network, after you train a deep network, you can get all the local linear model. Uh, from deep network. It's an exact local linear model is from the network. It's not a post hoc or it's not an auxiliary tool, uh, but it's really what the network does unlike Lime or Sharp. So Sri, you are using the uh, Boston house price prediction here is an example. So we uh, put the uh, neural network and then exact, exactly understand what are all the local linear models? So this is the uh, parallel coordinate plot uh, the, uh, of local linear model from deep network. And you can get the feature importance, which is exact feature importance. So it's not sampling, it's not approximation like Lime or Sharp because Lime and Sharp, uh, as good as they are, they can be misleading. They can be uh, inexact and inconsistent, where, where this one here is very consistent. So you can have exactly the local linear model. You can have, you can plot the profile plot, linear model along in each, for each variable. You can, you can see it, how linear, nonlinear, the interaction, when you see a cross line, like cross line like that crossing, that I mean a strong interaction for this variable because it's changing direction. So it's a strong interaction, different local linear model have different coefficient. You can see how the density plot, this is in wave, right? You can see the density plot, how the variable get grouped by the network. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, parallel density plots, but this is uh, incredibly beautifully done by the wave team and Shivam and uh, your team, Yoon, um, 
Zibin and Sartak and Vivian, they've all uh, partnered to build this. And you, you can see the global and local performance. This is showing the, uh, uh, because remember, Deep network is basically a lot of local linear models. So this is example of a few local linear model. You can see what is the global performance in terms of MSE as well as local performance. So this is the MSE and it is example, global local performance, the smaller, the better. Locally, the model is very, very good. That's why you see two bars. If you can slide, you see two bar. I think the bar on the left is a error for that local linear model. So it's very, very good. Globally, it's not good. So that means that's, that's why you need to have uh, this uh, deep learning model, right? Because linear model is not enough. Locally, it's very good. Locally, is enough. That's what is shown. But globally, when you apply all data, it's not good. So, so this is indication that, yes, you need more sophisticated model because a lot of... Uh, lot of interaction among variables. So you see it in the profile plot before when you see the cross line, there's a lot of interaction. That's you need a local linear model because uh, what, what deep ReLU does is basically local linear model. And this give, uh, give us a uh, high confidence in terms of the, uh, the model because we know exactly what the model does. We can get all the local linear equation from the network and how the data is partitioned. So, so this is very, very important uh, for, for diagnostic to understand how the model will be wrong, what is the weakness of the model, in what region the model is weakest, right? In this example, here is the, the tall bar on the blue bar, right? So that's uh, meaning that, well, you, you can look at the uh, locally as well, where, where the model is the weakest. So, so that's, that's all the, the detailed diagnostic that you do. So the model becoming really, fully, fully transparent, self-explainable because we don't apply additional tool here. We exactly just retrieving all the local linear model from, from the, uh, uh, unlike Lime, when you perturb and get local linear model, this is not, this is exactly the, the representation of deep learning. It's incredible. I think you've taken the advantage of um, think globally and act locally and apply that in, uh, in the fashion of uh, fit globally, but explain locally is um, really quite uh, quite a groundbreaking uh, piece. Yeah, and then you say as well, when deep learning, uh, probably before you do simplification, Sri, this is uh, interesting to see in the deep learning, yeah. If you scroll down on the count, on the on that table, on the top right table, the top one, Sri, because you drive it, the top one here, yeah. If you scroll down, I don't know if you can scroll down, you see a lot of scroll down. Lo a lot of local linear model only have one sample or two sample. If you have regression with one sample or two sample, can you trust it? Can you trust that local linear model? I would not, right? And by the way, when you train deep network, if you don't regularize it. And if you do early stopping, you will get a lot of those, a lot of local linear model with very, very few sample. In fact, extreme only one sample. And by the way, also if you train the network, a lot of local linear model, never seen any sample, right? So that's some of the danger when you use this. So, so one of this is we introduce the simplification, right? Oh, let's simplify it. Can we get the same performance, right? but in, in much, much control way, right? So suddenly in this situation from uh, the original 111 local linear model, right? Into six local linear model. With six local linear model, now you, if you scroll down that table, you see now the smallest is 37 sample in this example. So, and this is the, uh, the, the six local, lin local linear model that you need. You don't need, you don't need more than that. Okay, so six local linear model, it's good, it's good enough. And you know, uh, you have six local linear model that is, you know exactly what they are, it's very controllable. This is the thing that's very important in critical environment. We know exactly when the model will fail, right? Rather than not, not knowing when the model will fail. So in this six local linear model have high performance much, much simplified model, and we can control the failure. And this is part of the learning as well from COVID-19. When things change, 
we know how to deal with it because we know we have the beast that we already tame. If you don't control it, you have beasts that you cannot control. Here, we control it. We control how the model will behave, how the model will fail without sacrificing the performance. And that's uh, enabled by the, uh, the, uh, the, Alicia, the Alicia wave that you can go inside your network and you can simplify it, you can control the beast. Deep learning is very, very powerful, but if you don't control it, it's a real beast. Some incredible, incredible insights right there. She, um, let me scoot over for a quick question to Shivam and team. Uh, I know most of your team worked on this, uh, Gus, over the last, um, not that long, actually, maybe a week or so. Shivam, yeah. explain how, how, how does, what, is a, what does it take to build a wave application? Oh, yes. Uh, so so I, just to share, like I, I'm from data science side. Uh, I don't have knowledge of JavaScript, HTML, or CSS. So if I have, if I had to learn all these technologies, it might have taken me maybe three weeks or four weeks, equivalent to one month maybe, to build this type of an app where users can provide their interfaces, there are visual components and so on. But we have H2O Wave, which is our SDK with minimal code, low code Python based framework, where we can use that framework to develop these applications very quickly. And uh, for this app, Alithia app, we were able to build this whole AI app within like four or five days. The last was just polishing and mm -hmm. just the proofreading, but all the core work we were we managed to develop in like four days effort. I think that's very powerful, Sri. It's very impressive, uh, Shivam. You know, it says enable the uh, data scientists, right? To, uh, yes. to deploy application very, very rapidly so they can focus on the data science, right? And, and uh, this is a, a, a huge uh, 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 tools that, that you guys provide. Well, one app um, that actually Shivan built is a favorite of mine, where it's able to take a notebook, um, a Kaggle notebook, and automatically um, convert it to a wave application. So it's almost an app to build apps. So um, we would love for um, the world to um, use this and start building more um, applications, right? Sort of. So um, this is a this is just the beginning of uh, the um, the base of seeing a lot more um, in terms of applications across the board. So yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I will um, leave the team. Wave is open source. And so we would love for the um, world to start building applications um, and start um, generating and um, publishing them as well. So I'm super excited. Yeah, as a data scientist, Jupyter Notebooks are our favorite tool. But one of the limitations is that we don't have interactive interfaces for those same um, notebooks. So what we can do is we can convert those notebooks to interactive AI applications with more than static charts, more than static outputs. And uh, then an app will represent all the work that we have added in the Jupyter Notebook. That's where Wave adds the value for all the data science work that uh, data scientists have done. Let me um, double click on this particular chart, Agus. I know Boston housing data is relatively widely used. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things it's showing is the human side of it, right? So that yeah. Do you want to uh, comment on how? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, probably uh, a very popular data, si a data, data set that is included in scikit-learn, but it's also very, very controversial uh, showing the ugly side of data or, or, or data or data science, right? Because in this example, you can put it on the screen, Sri, on that one. Uh, put it back on the screen on this example. This is a uh, uh, Boston house price, right? The most uh, important variable here is, I think it's the LS stat and CRM in there. If I'm not mistaken, the LS stat is the low income housing 
pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, proportion of low uh, low income housing in there you know so so that's a very very important variable of course that's the uh, and then crime is the uh, uh, the crime side the crime rate right so it seems we have to in in the real world when we do uh, building model we have to be super super careful because some of the data and variable here they can be very discriminatory they are uh, if, if you're not very careful we're talking about the uh, a discriminatory aspect and the uh, the uh, the the ugly side okay the uh, of, of 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 data and the way uh, the society you know uh, have, have been uh, have been operating right if you're not careful understanding the source of data and when we build model that's where the dangers are because that's where we're dealing with fairness issue we're dealing with ethical issue in all of those things so the prerequisite of data science or any model building of course is really understanding the data what is the data tell us do we have any problem with that and do we want to even work on it and build model based on data that we know are very very biased so this is a big uh, big topic big issue today as we uh, in the past uh, we our operating model is we have hypotheses we have things we look at the data to 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 get better understanding today in the uh, in the world of machine learning the operating model is flip it's data driven we start from the data and let the data tell us instead of i have something i am going to look at the data to support my evidence now we let them the data to tell us and we let model to make decision based on a model that is trained and built with on the data so it's an extremely extremely important subject to to uh, really start with understanding the data, what can you use, what we cannot use, what we should not use. So that's that's a uh, that's a very very uh, important aspect. And it, if we don't control it, that's creating what I call it before, including in the model failure, unintended outcome, right? Unintended consequence. Model can create harm. If we make a public policy, we make do something based on this type of data, that is a very, very dangerous thing. How does one fight um, or balance for, in some sense, the inherent bias in historical decisions, right, historical data? Um, is, are there ways one can mitigate it? How do we um, create more robustness to, to balance for it? Well, I, I think it's a very, very, it depends on the situation and it can be very, very challenging, right? Because uh, this, uh, this is the, uh, it's, it's also part of the uh, societal norm, right? What acceptable, what not acceptable, what acceptable in Singapore and in the US, in Asia and Europe, uh, it's, it's very, very different. So I think that's a, a, a big challenge, of course. And I think uh, a lot more now with, 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 with the regulation as well as with a lot of attention on this, which is the right things to do to really uh, do this. So I think it was first of all is to, uh, you, you have process in the company and also some of the ethical standard, what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, right? So, so I think need to start from there. Do I want to build models, certain models? So we can say, well, no, we're not going to, to do that part because we know the model is, uh, is uh, we have trouble. Uh, it's societal bias in that, so we're not going to use it to make decision. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's sometimes it's a bit controversial in terms of do you want to to apply algorithms to to probably uh, to to maybe sample it differently. Some people argue I can sample it differently, right? To to make it more fair, or uh, people can say. Uh, I am going to train it differently. So I'm going to have a certain criteria so you can suppress the importance of certain variable and other variable to be more, more, more important. So, so it's, it's, it's less straightforward here, uh, but uh, the, the process and the, uh, 
uh, the the due diligence that we need to do is very, very important. So having process to understand the data and what's the implication, that's the starting point. For us in Wells Fargo, we have a very, uh, very pros clear process that our legal and compliance partner need to review because they are the expert on this. They need to review what variable we can or we cannot use. And then from that model developer can do the, the job to build model. And then they're going to test it, what variable importance and testing in the Mopias fairness testing that we do model validation will independently test it as well, get the outcome. And then from the outcome discuss again with our legal and compliance partner. So this is what uh, what's our finding. Sometimes it's very, very difficult decision. Sometimes it's very straightforward because they have rule and raw rule and regulation in uh, in uh, in credit. We have the uh, uh, ACOA, right? We have Reg B, who is very black and white in terms of what you can and you cannot do. So that is more straightforward. But other area is uh, can be more more difficult. For example, I give example. In uh, everybody do a lot of voice to text translation, right? Voice to text and when we start talking of voice to text, uh, model will not be perfect. Some people, some ethnic group coming from certain uh, geography will be more difficult for the model. So it has a lot of miss uh, translation from, from voice to text. Is it acceptable? Is it not? So we have to be very, very careful to really understand what's the outcome and the implication of that. We people can say, well, the model is useful. It, it helped to, to, uh, to, 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 to serve customer better, but is it? Because, because it, it serves customer better in certain area, it may, be, uh, it may not be uh, better or it may be not as, as good as in other, uh, for other type of customer. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, discussion that, that, that we have to, 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 to deal with when we start uh, applying machine learning for, for this uh, more complicated situation. Excellent. I think there was one other thing that the team was actually um, beginning to work on. And one of my favorite topics actually is how um, NLP um, needs, um, needs explanation as well. Mm. And I think um, we, the team was um, racing to, to put something together, but I think uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on. Sure, sure. Well, uh... In the, uh, this is a, a, a special uh, application in tax classification. We do a lot of tax classification in the company, right? Because we, we do uh, 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 complain, customer complain, how can we process customer complaint better and uh, route it to the right people and et cetera, so that complaint can be resolved very, very quickly. So we do a lot of tax classification in our surveillance monitoring. We do tax classification as well. So uh, it's probably a, one of the most applied in banking is uh, really in the NLP world is the tax classification. Now, when we do tax classification and if we did, uh, and interpretability is very important too, uh, in, uh, for many, many reasons, in, including unintended consequences I talk about, because language is, uh, it's uh, somewhat biased. So we have to be careful to understand it as well. So a part of thing that we do that we like to do is we use uh, CNN, Convolutional Neural Network. So the convolutional layer, we use it to do feature extraction. So we have n-gram, you have unigram, bigram, trigram. So, so the convolutional uh, layer can be constructed to that to represent the, uh, uh, the, the, the n-gram. So the key is in, in any of this, and when we talk, start talking about NLP, when we talk about interpretable model, we have two things. One is interpretable features. When the, the output from max pooling of CNN need to be interpretable, mm -hmm. right? It has interpretable features. Once we have interpretable features, the output from, from convolution layer go to fully connected layer. We need to have interpretable model. Now, interpretable model is the thing that was you show before using Alicia, you can make deep learning very interpretable. That's interpretable model. So we have two part here, interpretable features and then interpretable model. So that's what we do to have to, uh, to deal with both. 
uh, to have interpretable feature, interpretable, interpretable model. So interpretable features is very important in NLP, in particular because we dealing with embedded word embedding, right? We are from uh, one hot representation of word, we create, we, we translate it into word embedding. When we have word embedding, the interpretability disappear. If we have one hot encoding, you know which variable or which word are important. But once you put it in word embedding, it's not, it's, the, the interpretability is gone. It's lost because it's distributed representation for each word. That's the uh, the trick that we do on the uh, on the CNN. How to go through the n-gram structure on the convolutional network so that from word embedding that's not interpretable becoming uh, interpretable feature. So so read our paper on that, and the new paper will come out. To uh, the the paper that is published out there it says interpretable feature, and then to uh, uh, deep, uh, deep network using SHARP, but we also have the one that is really uh, uh, interpretable feature and then use the uh, uh, interpretable using using Alicia. This is incredible. Um, there's a good set of uh, Q&A um, in the Q&A section. I'm, I'm gonna point to Alethea's uh, publication on the about page as well. And a uh, lot of interesting tool chain also built, right? Sort of uh, self explainable ML um, uh, in, on GitHub, H2O Wave, um, ways to contribute to this. Um, please uh, reach out to Shibam uh, or Agus uh, or me, and we would love to open this up for community to kind of um, contribute and improve. Explainability is not, a, uh, not an option, it is a must have, from what I understand. Um, uh, from Agu's comments today, um, people's livelihoods are being determined by automatic machine learning and machine learning. Uh, and as data scientists, we owe it to ourselves to make sure that we, we give, bring transparency to these decisions. I will start with some of these questions, um, Agu's there. Um, many of them are, are um, actually around explainability. Um, kind of, um, what is, in your view, using semi-supervised approaches for credit modeling? Is that too risky? And uh, my question is, why do we want to do semi-supervised when you can do supervised? Mm -hmm. Right? The data is there. Data is available. Right? The only re reason that you do a semi-supervised is you feel like, okay, I, I don't have enough. I don't have enough data. Or Maybe you, if you want to do somewhat some supervise, if you say, uh, uh, I can, uh, I can make the model more robust. For example, let me. This is very popular things like people do, like how to make the model more robust. Well, I'm going to perturb the data, and I'm going to train the model with the perturbed data, right? So, so that's probably we can do something like that. But I, I. If, if you, I, I don't know, I'm in the camp, if you don't have data, just don't do a complicated model, do a simple model as possible. Uh, I think this is the problem as well, that people want to use a bigger and bigger neural networks. Well, I, this is my personal opinion. If I have very big model that can do wonderful thing, I am not impressed. I am impressed with, I can have small model that can do wonderful things. So I think that's, uh, I am very impressed. This is why part of the Alicia wave, you see it's really, it has simplification. I can simplify it. I don't need this deep, big, uh, deep learning because it's, uh, it's only uh, small model are very important. This is one thing that's very interesting as well. Uh, explainability and using Alicia is very important. A while back, remember a while back in the uh, New Rips has a uh, competition sponsored by FICO that Professor Rudin from Duke won on the interpretable model. I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor Rudin won with either uh, uh, logistic regression or three. I, I don't exactly remember. I think logistic regression. When you run Alicia on that FICO data and then you hit simplify, it will get simplified into a single model, which is logistic regression. The data is 
just linear. So you don't need the complicated stuff. So this is what, what we would like to do as a data scientist, right? So we apply, yes, fine, apply complicated machinery, deep network or whatever. And then let's look at the structure. Then when we hit, that's why we provide the tool on the simplification in LACI is you can simplify it. When many ways to simplify it. Of course, you can simplify to re, through regularization in deep network. You can apply uh, with DK, like basically L2 penalty, or if you want to really simplify it, you apply L1 penalty, right? Uh, which is large. So that's the uh, uh, Rob Tipsirani and Trevor Hasley stuff, right? You apply large. So L1 penalty in any deep learning package, it says L1 penalty too. You can apply that, that when you run Alicia, you can compare the one with L1 penalty and the one with without L1 penalty, which is uh, basically early stopping or, or, or dropout. Okay, I'll drop out. You can compare the number of local linear model across those things. And then you hit simplify, you can simplify it. How much simplify, do you do you a uh, sacrifice performance or not? We'll be surprised depending on the data, some situation, not always, in some situations, the simpler model is better, but not always, okay? So so depend on that, but at least uh, we have, uh, as part of model builder, uh, we, 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 we need to be responsible to understand that, to control at the very least controlling the piece uh, or, or controlling what how the model will fail and really understand the model. One question that um, came up is around, how do you think about third party embedded models that are coming in say in um, a, a more complex software say, um, a voice recognition system or an NLP uh, model embedded into a more uh, complex uh, software. Uh, yeah, we uh, we tested as well. So uh, all the third-party model in Wells Fargo has to be tested the same like internally developed model. So you may not be able to see the uh, the inside how it works, but still you can do a lot of testing. Uh, this is the uh, things that the uh, my bring back to my graduate school day, right? And uh, you can do system identification, right? You do input output. You can do design of experiment on the input and get the output. You can do that. You can do counterfactual testing, the robustness testing that you you have, right? So you do counterfactual type of testing to test to test that so it's a, a lot more limited in terms of what you can do because you don't do you don't understand what's what's inside it but it doesn't mean that you cannot test it and a lot of a lot of sophisticated testing that we we can apply that's what we did okay so and we also looking at how is it if it's compared so i think the key is third party do you know how the model will fail right so we test it we have to test it we cannot just we cannot just deploy it because at the end of the day, when they fail, it's our responsibility. So test for failure, and there are many ways to test for failure. So you test it more like a black box, right? So of course you test it like a black box, but still you can do testing. No, I think one of the things that um, we've been looking at in addition to uh, model validation is um, methods like um, back testing, right? Sort of, uh, how do you start building some back testing automatically for the models? How do you continuously look for drift, detecting drift? Um, here's a, here's a, um, most of the stuff is automatically built for models that are being run in the environment. So people can essentially, uh, even at the model start um, terribly, they end up um, better. And you can see that how the variable importance is changing mm -hmm. over time. Yeah, yeah. Drift detection. Um, much of this is inspired by the incredible work you're uh, doing uh, in um, model validation, uh, Magus, and some of the conversations you've had. But our, our vision on um, making the environments more continuously learning in an app store way so people can build their own applications, roll their own uh, app stores even. So there's a H2O score apps uh, here, but we expect our customers to build their own app, app stores or AI for good app stores and go um, into finance. Hopefully we are with the um, beginning of way, we hope to uh, inspire more applications inside Wells Fargo and take it not just to our customers, but their customers 
And because I think apps are much easier way to understand and use AI. And that's kind of our um, team here with H2O AI Cloud. We're super excited for the journey here. Um, and um, our customers have been the true, true guiding force for us in the innovation, um, especially around um, explainability and robustness. Um, your work is, um, is, uh, is um, groundbreaking. So we're super excited to partner with your team on this. More questions that are here are around, how do you um, communicate um, and regulations? So uh, the, the, the battle between regulations and ethically right decisions. When regulations allow it, and when it is not the right thing to do, how do we communicate that to all stakeholders? I, I have a slightly different view, you know? Uh, I live in regulated uh, entity, right? So uh, if you look at it, a lot of check and balance what happened in banks because this is a systemically important institution, right? So if something happened with the uh, systemically important institution like banks, it has a big impact to the, uh, to the society and to the uh, economy of the country as, as a whole. So, so, so with that check and balance is very, very important. For example, in our case, yeah, think about the regulation in the, uh, in the financial world. We have the, uh, we call it a multiple line of defense. The front, front line are people who build model and deploy model and use model, right? And then you have second line, which is risk management, right? Who, who oversight, who test it, independent testing and all of those things. And then we have our, our audit team who testing the second line and the first line. Okay, so that's the third line. And then we have the fourth line, actually, our external auditor, right? We have external auditor who check what, uh, what we have done. And then we have the fifth checker, actually, which is the regulator. Uh, some of you that's not familiar with financial institution, uh, OCC and, FD and, 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 and FRB, both of them, they are equipped with a lot of PhDs. In this in in in, uh, in in quantitative world, PhD in math, stat, and all those things, they coming and they check our model. So it's a check and balance, and 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 depend on the uh, how important and how critical. And when the model is wrong, what is the harm? So I think it depends on how harmful the model can be. That's when the rigor or the regulation or whatever. So. I, I, I communicate a lot with the regulator. They are extremely, extremely very, very sensible when you, when they, when they can, when, when you, when you are competent, you know? So I, I, I never have any, any, any things that really, we occasionally we have disagreement, but they, they are make sense. They, they are in the interest of protecting the country. They are in the interest of protecting the, uh, the customer as a whole. Right, so I think that's uh, that's very very important, and they have been very they they they, they bring very very good view. And uh, if we are competent, we know what to what to how to explain. We really understand it. We can explain, and they they listen to it. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for uh, incredible words of wisdom. And um, I actually loved the concept of simple models, right? Sort of. Um, during COVID, one of the best things we could do was build simple models because the times were changing so fast, the data was changing mm -hmm. so fast. Mm -hmm. It's important to keep track of what really is happening in the data. Mm -hmm. the, the ability to see through the model because mm -hmm. it's a simple one was so influential. And it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility and sustainability too, right? Three is not burning the uh, the energy, right? So uh, when, I, when I talk about some other area, for example, some of the Bitcoin mining, and probably the biggest Bitcoin mining happened in uh, in China, and they are the biggest coal burner, right? <laughs> to, uh, and, and when you do that, so I think in the machine learning world, we are the same way. You know, our model becoming bigger and bigger, and all those things. I, I think it's not the bigger model is the better, okay? I, I feel like the simplest model uh, is, is in, 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 in that world, but also simpler model that's more tractable, 
it's uh, with high performance. We don't want to sacrifice the performance, right? Uh, but the uh, uh, that's is very important because we 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 can control when I mean, we understand how the model will fail. I think it's the the most irresponsible things, and if we deploy model without understanding how the model will fail and how the model will harm our customer, that's the most irresponsible thing. You know, I think customers are creating great customer experiences. Is exactly why we are here, and AI should be really um, in service of making that happen and um, explaining it, debugging it, understanding it, understanding the data, all of that is aided by, by simplicity. Um, I know you're um, out uh, in the wilderness track, um, climbing mountains and seeing simple things in the nature. Um, <laughs> tell us about um, where you are, um, not, you're obviously not in front of your office, which I recognize from. Um, well, I, uh, I I try to enjoy the nature here. I live in North Carolina. We have a beautiful scenery. Mountain is two hours away from us. So we have beautiful places, uh, mountain, gorgeous river, waterfall, anything. So I try to enjoy uh, as much as possible uh, when I'm not uh, writing algorithm or thinking about math. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, going in the middle of uh, in the middle of the wood without any phone connection, just enjoy nature, right? Especially important nowadays during the uh, COVID-19 when when we cannot travel a lot. I, I always enjoy travel uh, around the world. Now I cannot travel. So uh, I enjoy what's uh, really what's in the backyard now. now nature, nature brings that simplicity and like nature H2O, we are um, striving for that simplicity and allow our customers because they drive us to being excellent so i think that's 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 what i like about you guys you know you're always very uh customer centric you talk to us a lot you know listen to what 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 we need and uh, that has been uh, uh tremendous in my view it's the team um you're part of our journey and so so excited and there's so so, so many more ones in the audience and the community and the customer um, love actually brought us this far. So we're super thrilled to be have the opportunity to serve um, your um, your innovation, to be honest. And on uh, Lithia, super excited to see it being used uh, everywhere uh, yeah. globally. So we uh, we are keep pushing. Uh, we keep pushing. You know, for us, it's the uh, the journey to have a high performance, explainable, uh, self uh, self explanatory intrinsically interpretable model, you know, because with all the noise, what all the thing, I feel like the explainability is very, very important. That's why we spend uh, really, really a lot of time on, in that. Uh, I, I'm happy to be able to share with, 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 with H2O and jointly uh, working together with H2O to make some of the tool available for, for people out there. Yeah, we call it um, makers um, gonna make, it's maker culture and we are so excited to to have a partner of equal caliber or greater caliber to make more uh, beautiful things and uh, explainable things, uh, intelligent things. Super excited. Thank you for joining us, Agus, today. Thank and you. Thank you, everyone who uh, spent their time with us. Thanks, Shwem. Luna and Nana. <laughs>